So what did the doctor tell his patient who had kidney stones? He said, Sir, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in my thoughts. Um, hi everybody, it's Dr. Ryan here. And we're going to be talking about history and examination of the renal system. Hope you and your family are well. Here's the outline of today's talk. We're going to be tackling a handy clinical case and then look into genital and urinary history taking and then tackling an approach to examination of the genital urinary system, talking about the technique behind examination, looking at renal masses and the truckload of differentials behind those, interpreting changes in the urine dipstick, talking a bit about proteinuria, hematuria, touching on chronic kidney disease, and we're going to be closing with investigations of renal disease and encouragement from scripture, all right? Here's our clinical case. In evaluation of acute kidney injury in a patient who has recently undergone cardiopulmonary bypass during mitral valve replacement, which of the following findings on urine microscopy is most suggestive of cholesterol emboli as being the source of the renal failure? Is it A, calcium oxalate crystals, B, eosinophiluria, C, granular casts, D, normal sediment, or E, white blood cell casts? Mm, I wonder. So this is my time on a sequence for history taking. I'm sure if you're familiar with my videos, you're familiar with this template. The mnemonic here is helps salt makes good food, so tantalizing it. But of course, we're honing into the systemic inquiry as it pertains to the renal system. Also note, medication history is very important. Uh, noting conditions like diabetes, hypertension, HIV, which has the potential to damage the kidneys, as well as a variety of therapeutic options, right? especially medication like amphotericin B like aminoglycoside antibiotics, like non anti-inflammatory drugs, right? So you want to take a good medication history. Now, when teasing out the systemic inquiry as it pertains to the renal system, you want to ask first about change in the appearance of urine. Sometimes this may be obvious, for instance, hematuria, which is macroscopic. Then you want to inquire about changes in the urine volume or stream. So if you have to typically quantify this in the hospital setting, Polyuria is defined as passage of more than 3 liters of urine per 24 hours. Oliguria is the passage of less than 400 mls of urine per 24 hours. And urea is even worse, less than 100 mls per 24 hours. You want to inquire from the patient about nocturia, which pertains to maybe diabetes mellitus. A decrease in the stream size, hesitancy on starting to pass urine, terminal dribbling after passing urine and urinary retention all of which could suggest maybe BPH in, in an elderly male. Uh, and these are what we call lower urinary tract symptoms. Then there's this entity called Stranguri, Stranguri, which uh, speaks to a blockage or irritation at the bladder base and describes a severe pain with an intense urge to urinate. Another symptom is called pus in <laughs> It speaks to double voiding, which implies incomplete bladder emptying, as well as incontinence of urine is something we must always ask about, right? What about renal colic? Now, renal colic is typically described as loin to groin pain, and it speaks to some kind of obstruction calling, causing colicky pain in those ureters, most commonly, um, you know, a, a renal stone. Then you want to inquire about dysuria, which speaks to painful maturation, and of course, that's coupled with frequency, urgency, and incontinence, uh, fever and loin pain, any erythral discharge. And you also want to inquire about symptoms suggestive of chronic kidney disease in the way of, like we mentioned, oliguria, nocturia, polyuria, anorexia, a metallic taste in the mouth, vomiting, fatigue, hiccups, insomnia, as well as pruritus, intense pruritus. It's itchy, man. Bruising and edema as well. Then in terms of the uh, genital portion of the genital urinary history, it's good to inquire about menses and females and talk about the age of onset, which is menach the regularity of the periods, the last period date, as well as inquire about dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia. In men, uh, you know, it's a bit of a touchy issue, but it's good to inquire, especially in diabetics, about impotence and loss of libido and infertility. And the females, uh, how many times have they been pregnant before? So establish the parity and gravidity and any complications in those pregnancies. It's good to inquire about urethral and vaginal discharge, as well as any genital rash. Alrighty. So this is taken from McLeod's and shows us the location of the kidneys. They sit, as we know, retroperitoneally, uh, just behind the 11th rib. you got a right and a left kidney, all right? And this is just demonstrating the functional unit of the kidney, which is the nephron. Okay, so we start off with uh, the vasculature, right? So we have an afferent arteriole, which gives rise to the glomerulus and the afferent arteriole. And thereafter, that forms the renal artery and the renal vein. What happens here is that blood is filtered through the glomerulus and passes through a system of tubules, alrighty? So we have the proximal convoluted tubule, 
Then we have the loop of Henel, which consists of uh, a thin wall segment and a thick wall segment, descending and ascending. Right, then that gives rise to the distal convoluted tubule and then the collecting tubule which goes to the collecting duct and out via the ureter. Alrighty. So this is just demonstrating once again the male urinary tract. So we start off with um, the calluses. So you have the renal pelvis and the calyx which drains the renal pyramids coming down into the ureter and that comes down at the bladder and from the bladder out via the urethra, right? So we have the internal sphincter and the external sphincter here, right? And we have different portions of the urethra. We have the prostatic urethra, we have the membranous urethra, the spongios urethra, and the external urethra. Okay, so this is giving us a bird's eye view of what we're going to encounter when we examine the renal system. So we're going to observe generally for pallor and fatigue and, and tiredness, breathlessness, and assess the hydration in terms of reduction in skin turgor or fluid depletion, uh, bruising, itching, and scratch marks, right? In the hands, you look for asterixis. Remember, the differential for asterixis is broad. It can be renal failure, respiratory failure, hepatic failure, the list goes on. In the nails, you want to pay attention to Bose lines, splinter hemorrhages, pigmentation, and mux lines, as well as Terry's nails, right? In the arms, don't miss the opportunity to take the pulse and the blood pressure. Look for AV fistula and carpal tunnel syndrome. In the face and neck, you're looking for the sallow complexion, pallor. Check the JVP to assess whether the patient is full volume overloaded. So smell for uremic fetal, but this, of course, has fallen out of favor because of the risk of transmission of COVID. So, I mean, that's not a very uh, prudent sign. But also, be on the lookout for gingival hyperplasia. In the eyes, you're looking for the typical changes of hypertensive and diabetic retinopathy as well as band keratopathy. You want to ask our Tate and the procedure basis for crackles, and also note if there's hyperventilation in the way of Cosmos respiration and the heart, you want to listen for any extra heart sounds, which may speak to full volume overload or a pericardial friction drop, which happens with uremia. In the abdomen, we're going to talk about that, right, later on. In the legs, check for edema, which speaks to hyperproteinemia and fluid overload and, of course, examine for peripheral neuropathy. Okay, let's get started, guys. When you're examining the renal system, you want to lay the patient flat in bed while performing the usual general inspection. You want to particularly note the mental status of the patient, the presence of a sallow complexion, the state of hydration, and any hyperventilation or hiccuping. Then detailed examination begins with the hands and examination of the nails, which may reveal leukonychia because of hypoalbuminemia in the setting of nephrotic syndrome, all right? You may have white transverse lines, something we call mux lines, a single white band, which is mes lines, and a distal brown arc, which is what we term half and half nails, or Terry's nails. We're going to see a picture of that later on. You want to examine the wrists and arms for vascular access sites. Get the patient to hold out the hands, right? cock up the wrists to separate the fingers and look for the flapping tremor of asterixis. You want to inspect the arms for bruising. Remember that in uh, renal impairment we have a qualitative platelet dysfunction which will lead to problems with clotting and inevitably you end up with bruising. No oh dear. Subcutaneous nodules uh, and also calcium phosphate deposits, pigmentation, scratch marks, and gouty tophi. So here's a beautiful picture showing us uh, pruritus and scoriation in the lower limbs associated with chronic kidney disease. Here's a beautiful picture of Terry's nails, otherwise known as half and half nails, with the distal half being hyperpigmented and the proximal half being hypopigmented, right? This is an example of an arterial venous fistula showing sites of needle cannulation for hemodialysis. Alrighty. Okay, then you want to proceed to the face and examine the eyes, looking for pallor, for jaundice and band, keratopathy. Examine the mouth for dryness, ulcers, and for fetal. And note the presence of a vasculitic rash on the face. Always be on the lookout, especially in young females, for the butterfly rash of systemic lupus erythematosus, the wolf. Oh. The patient should be lying flat while the abdomen is examined. You want to note any scars indicative of peritoneal dialysis, or any operations, including a prior renal transplant. Palpate those kidneys, and we covered how to ballot and feel for kidneys when we looked at the examination of the abdomen in a previous video. I encourage you to go and have a look at that. So you want to palpate for kidneys, including transplanted kidneys, then examine for the liver and the spleen, feel for an abdominal aortic aneurysm, percuss over that bladder, and determine whether there's ascites, and the telltale signs of ascites are shifting down as fluid thrill, and you may have a puddle sign. Listen for those renal breeze, uh, you know, listen, uh, just two centimeters 
above the umbilicus to the left or to the right. And listen for those renal breeze. And rectal examination is indicated to detect prostatomegaly or bleeding as indicated. So here is showing us the proper technique for blotting the kidneys. So you go one posterior, one anterior, and you try and blot the kidneys between the two. Alrighty. Um, so this is once again just a different picture showing the same technique of blotting of the kidneys. This is what we affectionately call Murphy's kidney punch. Right, so this is trying to ascertain whether the patient has any loin pain associated with pyelonephritis. Okay, um, so that being said, we just get to sit the patient up and palpate the back for tenderness and for any sacral edema. Look at the jugular venous pressure with the patient at 45 degrees. If it's elevated, it may speak to fluid volume overload. You want to examine the heart for signs of pericarditis, which happens in the setting of uremia, cardiac failure, and auscultate those uh, posterior lung bases for pulmonary edema. Okay, so this is how we assess for renal angle tenderness as shown, all right. So a differential, if you find a big old renal mass, it could be a unilateral palpable kidney or bilateral palpable kidneys. Now the common culprits for unilateral palpable kidney include renal cell carcinoma. It could be unilateral hydronephrosis or pyonephrosis. It could be polycystic kidneys with asymmetrical enlargement. It could be acute renal vein thrombosis, acute pyelonephritis, renal abscess, or compensatory hypertrophy of a single functional kidney. If you get bilateral big old palpable kidneys, it could indicate adult onset polycystic kidney disease, bilateral hydronephrosis, renal cell carcinoma, diabetic nephropathy early on, nephrotic syndrome, infiltrative disease like amyloidosis, lymphoma, the list goes on, acromegaly, and very rarely bilateral renal vein thrombus. All right, then you want to lay the patient down and look at the legs. Look at them legs for edema, which could signify nephrotic syndrome or cardiac failure. Check for bruising, pigmentation, scratch marks, and note for the presence of any gouty tophi. Lastly, examine for peripheral neuropathy, in which case that will manifest as diminished sensation and loss of the more distal reflexes. Don't miss the opportunity to measure the blood pressure, both lying and standing, or else you're going to miss postural or orthostatic hypotension. Do your fundoscopy and look for those beautiful changes of diabetic and hypertensive retinopathy. And guys, I know we said if the last thing was in the previous lab, but actually there's more to look for. I'm sorry, I was wrong. You want to do your urine dipstick. And what you're looking for is specific parameters like the specific gravity, the pH, the glucose, the presence of blood, protein, leukocytes, and ketones. Okay, so here we're looking at some causes of urinary color changes, right? So if the urine is very pale or colorless, that indicates dilute urine. And you can bet your bottom dollar that patient is overhydrated or had uh, maybe diabetes insipidus or has post-obstructive diuresis. If the urine is yellow-orange, that speaks to very concentrated urine. So the patient is probably dehydrated, but it could be caused by bilirubin or certain substances as mentioned. If it's brownish urine, it's probably bilirubin in there. Or of course, some antibodies can cause it as well. Pink urine usually speaks to beetroot consumption or... Uh, phenophthalene or uric acid crystalluria, which is massive. Red urine is always concerning for hematuria, but it can also be due to hemoglobinuria or myoglobinuria, which may also be pink, brown, or black. Watch out for other causes like porphyria or porphyrins. And if you're not sure whether a patient is compliant on their TB treatment, just look at the urine. If the urine is nice and orange, that probably speaks to rifampicin causing it, okay, so that patient is probably compliant on the TB treatment. And the causes of green and black urine are mentioned here as well as white or milky urine speaking to chyluria. If your name is Kyle, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about chyluria. So here we're looking at causes of proteinuria. So proteinuria can be due to renal disease or non-renal disease. From the causes of renal uh, causes of proteinuria, we speak to glomerulonephritis, diabetes mellitus, amyloidosis, SLE, drugs like gold and penicillinamine, malignancy as in myeloma or infection. But non-renal causes include fever, severe exertion, burns, heart failure, orthostatic proteinuria, which occurs when the patient is upright but not lying down. And that will manifest usually in the first morning sample, which will not show proteinuria. And of course, severe hypertension, all right? This is a fun diagram from medcomic.com showing us a differential uh, or the different kinds of urinary casts that we get, right? So a broad or a waxy cast happens in the setting of chronic renal failure. A highline cast can happen with exercise, diuretics, concentrated urine. Fatty casts in the way of oval fat bodies usually are pathognomonic for nephrotic syndrome, okay? Uh, 
A white blood cell cast happens in the setting of interstitial nephritis or pyelonephritis. A red blood cell cast with glomerular nephritis. A renal tubular epithelial cell cast happens in the setting of acute tubular necrosis. Yes, if pre-renal failure goes on without being appropriately managed, it can give rise to ATN, which is probably the most common cause of AKI in the hospital setting. Granular casts in the setting of chronic, chronic renal failure. Uh, but if it's muddy brown casts, that usually happens in the setting of acute tubular necrosis. Just talking a bit about nephrotic syndrome, okay? The definition of nephrotic syndrome has to do with proteinuria, which is above 3.5 grams per 24 hours. And all the other features can be simply explained by that loss of protein. So you also get hypoalbuminemia with the serum albumin being below 30 grams per liter. You get edema on account of the hypoalbuminemia. And you get hyperlipidemia. Why, pray tell, do you get hyperlipidemia? Due to the increased LDL and cholesterol, probably from loss of the plasma factors that regulate lipoprotein synthesis. And the common culprits for nephrotic syndrome, if it's secondary, are drugs, as mentioned, systemic disease in the way of SLE or diabetes, amyloidosis. It could be uh, a malignancy associated, the likes of muscle myeloma, lymphoma, and infections, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, infidipinicoditis, malaria, HIV. But we also have the primary flavor of nephrotic syndrome, and the usual culprits there are membranous glomerular nephritis, minimal change glomerular nephritis, and focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis. What are the common causes of glycosidia and ketonuria? Well, of course, the poster child for glycosidia is diabetes mellitus. Uh, however, other reducing substances can also cause it, as well as the impaired renal tubular ability to absorb glucose, especially affecting the proximal tubules. And if that be the case, you'll also have leakage of protein uh, and other substances, and that's what we call Fanconi syndrome. Ketonuria often happens in the setting of diabetic ketoacidosis, starvation, also an alcoholic-induced ketoacidosis as well. This is a nice diagram showing us the different sources of hematuria. So it could be coming from the kidney in the way of renal cancer, glomerular nephritis, polycystic kidney disease, renal vascular disease. It could be TB affecting the urinary tract, uh, being in the kidney or in the ureters, hypertension-induced nephrosclerosis. It could be a transitional cell cancer, now coming lower down, uh, can be due to renal stones, schistosomiasis in the bladder, urinary tract infection, prostate cancer, urethritis, or contamination, right? So there's a whole truckload of causes of hematuria, right? And then we can further satisfy that into whether the hematuria is painless, painful, or either. The common causes of painless hematuria, glomerular nephritis, TB, right? Schistosomiasis, hypertensive nephrosclerosis, acute tubular necrosis, renal ischemia, as well as coagulation disorders. If that hematuria is associated with pain, you're thinking about a urinary tract infection or the loin to grain pain of renal stones with obstruction. Uh, and these causes mentioned at the bottom can either manifest with painless or painful hematuria. Okay, looking at the features of chronic kidney disease in this beautiful diagram from McLeod's. So um, you want to look if the patient has any uh, dialysis catheter, right? Whether it's a Tenkoff or whether it's a temporary vascular catheter or a dual lumen permanent catheter. You're looking for a yellow complexion, pallor. The JVP is usually raised in the setting of fluid volume overload or with tamponade um, coming from uremia, right? There could be an increased respiratory rate and depth in metabolic acidosis, speaking to Cosmos respiration. Watch out for the pericardial friction rub. Feel for a transplanted kidney with overlying scar. Look for your teddy's nails. Look for the excoriation. Look for easy bruising. And examine for peripheral neuropathy in the way of absent reflexes, diminished sensation, and paresthesia. This is a fun way to represent the different stages of chronic kidney disease. So we know it's stage 1 through stage 5. And stage 3 is split into 3A and 3B. So with stage 1, there's kidney damage with a normal or increased glomerular filtration rate. And the GFR here is usually above 90. And our aim here is to diagnose and treat the underlying condition and comorbidities. Uh, stage 2, KDGO, is where your GFR drops to between 60 and 89. And here we want to estimate the rate of progression. Stage 3 is what we call moderate, right? Which is a GFR between 30 and 59, right? So if it's between um, basically 45 and 59, that's what we call CKD stage 3A. And 3B is between 30 and 45. And here we aim to evaluate and treat complications. If your GFR drops between 15 and 29, that's what we call stage 4 or severe CKD. And here we want to make preparations for renal replacement therapy because that patient is going to require dialysis soon. Stage 5 is 
uh, end stage renal disease, which is basically where the patient requires dialysis. This is just showing us a nice urine dipstick. And here are the different parameters we're going to look at when you're analyzing the urine dipstick. Right? So the specific gravity reflects the urine solid concentration and varies between 1.002 and 1.035. The, the specific gravity is increased when the kidneys actively reabsorb water, as in the setting of fluid depletion or renal failure due to diminished perfusion. Abnormally low specific gravity speaks to failure of the kidneys to concentrate urine. The normal urine pH is between 4.5 and 8. In renal tubular acidosis, the pH never falls below 5.3 despite acidemia. Of course, look for glucose. Small amounts excreted in the urine are usually normal, but anything above 2 plus is uh, pathological. Check for your ketones, check for protein, for blood, for bilirubin and urobilinogen, for leukocyte esterase, which would probably speak to urinary tract infection or inflammation, stones or urothelial cancers. Check for your nitrites as well, which also speaks to infection. All right. The common causes of chronic kidney disease. The most common cause of chronic kidney disease worldwide is diabetes and hypertension closely there. But in the developing world, glomerulonephritis is also an emerging cause. And of course, the other causes as mentioned here. One of the clinical features that suggest that renal failure is chronic rather than acute is your small kidney size on ultrasound, except when you're dealing with polycystic kidneys, diabetes, amyloidosis, and myeloma. Those are the four exceptions. Otherwise, CKD usually manifests with bilateral small kidneys, Renal bone disease, which is termed renal osteodystrophy, but you also get adenomic bone disease and Brown's tumor. Anemia with normal red blood cell indices. It's a normal static normochromic anemia. Why do you get that? Because of diminished erythropoietin coming from the kidney and peripheral neuropathy. So these four features speak to chronicity of kidney disease already. Okay, guys, we're just approaching the end shortly. This is just a list of the different biochemical and serological investigations we do in the setting of kidney disease. So we can estimate your creatinine clearance, we can compute your estimated glomerular filtration rate, and we spoke about that. You do the urea and electrolytes, where you look at the different individual electrolytes, looking at potassium, which is usually high in advanced CKD, bicarbonate, which is going to be low because of the acidosis. You have diminished calcium on the back of impaired renal vitamin D3 activation and hyperphosphatemia and diminished excretion in CKD. Increased urate is common in CKD, but seldom associated with gout. You can also do the urine osmolality, the alkaline phosphatase and parathyroid hormone, which tends to be increased in the setting of secondary hyperparathyroidism related to diminished calcium and increased phosphate. And if you're looking for a prospective cause, you can also look at your antinuclear factor and your anchor, as we know that SLE and vasculitis may affect the kidneys. All right. Other investigations, as mentioned, the plain abdominal X-ray, uh, as we note that more than 90% of stones are radio-opaque. An ultrasound scan, it can be done for a number of reasons, to assess the kidney size and shape and position, to look for evidence of obstruction and hydronephrosis or hydroureter, to assess for renal cysts or solid lesions with stones, to uh, establish uh, the post maturation residual volume and any gross abnormality of the bladder, and it's also used to guide kidney biopsy. Doppler ultrasound of the renal vessels, if you're thinking about renal artery stenosis, renal vein thrombosis, or renal vascular disease. You can also go for IV urography or CT urography if you're suspecting uh, a urological issue in the way of stone disease, or renal mass, tumor staging, and so forth. Other investigations include uh, CT angio or MR angio, isotope scan, and renal biopsy, which is used to diagnose parenchymal renal disease. So coming back to our case, guys, in the setting of or in the evaluation of AKI in a patient who has recently undergone cardiopulmonary bypass during mitral valve replacement, which of the following findings are suggestive of cholesterol emboli as a source of the renal failure? Drum roll, please. Drrr, ding. Eosinophil urea. So as we know that cholesterol emboli are an important source of AKI in patients who have undergone cardiac procedures that may disrupt aortic atherosclerotic disease. Now the telltale sign, guys, on physical examination of this is what we call levador reticularis, which is a net-like formation that we see in the skin. Peripheral blood eosinophilia may be present as well. So everybody, I just want to encourage you from the scripture today. I want to talk about growing old. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 46, verse 4, uh, it, it tells us, Even to your old age, I am he, and to gray hairs I will carry you. The book of Psalm, chapter 90, verse 12 says, Lord, teach us to number our days, so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Listen, none of us are getting any younger. But the promise is that the Lord is with us. 
He is always with us and he will never leave nor forsake us. I pray that you will actively pursue him and actively pursue Jesus even as we grow old. These are my references. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you soon with another video on my YouTube channel. I just want to thank everybody for your support in watching my videos and subscribing and liking and sharing. God bless you in abundance. I'll see you soon.